On the 6th of February, 1958, sport suffered one of its greatest tragedies. The Munich air crash brought sudden death to a football team many consider the finest Britain has produced. 50 years on, this is the story told through film archive and the memories of people who were there. coming out, Roger, Johnny Berry, Jackie Bansflower, Ray Wood, Bill Fuchs, Tommy Taylor, Billy Whelan, that is, no question. And here's Duncan, wow. Duncan Edwards, David Pegg. Good team, good players. Yeah, that's a really nice thing to have that, it's lovely. This film is believed to be the only color footage of the Busby Babes of Manchester United. Playing in blue, they were captured by an amateur cameraman working for Burnley FC at a match between the sides in April 1957. This is the first time Sir Bobby Charlton has seen the film. I have a crack from outside the box. I didn't see the crowd jumping up, so I must have missed. No arguing with the referee. You see that? <laughs> well, this is this is unique. It's a unique footage. This is wow. Wow. It's a great team. Great team on the verge of things, yeah. And Taylor finds the net. It's a pass by Whelan, sent Berry racing through to equalize. In the mid-1950s, a group of young players gloriously widened the horizons of English football. They were, they were living a dream, really, and, the, and the, the dream just came true, you know. I mean, they wanted to play football, and then suddenly... Four minutes before half-time, Manchester's Violet goes through, and it's a goal! How good was that team? The best. They were the best. The black and white newsreels show a side playing inspired football that lifted the spirits of a nation sunk in post-war austerity. A new generation of fans was hooked. And there it is! When people say, well, how would you feel if you won the lottery? They were our lottery. Yeah, yeah. We won the lottery watching the babes. Yeah, mm. we really did. They were called the Busby Babes because they embodied a visionary manager's faith in youth. Questioned by journalists, Matt Busby made his bold philosophy sound simple. I have a scouting system whose sole object is to go out looking for young, promising school boys, youth club boys, and indeed any young players who have the necessary natural ability to have a, make a future Man United player. The Busby Babes was about that wonderful gathering together of youth against all odds. Because in those days, you were told kids win nothing. Oh, by God, they do. Barry going through with it by himself. Cross it comes and Palms made a perfect hit. It's a goal! It's a goal! It's a... When United took me, it's not hard to describe. Fact is fact. It was a dream come true. And I was joining, without doubt at that time, the Hollywood of football. There was no arguing with that. It was the Hollywood of football. And it was quite a cast list. Roger Byrne captained a team packed with outrageously young internationals. But if there was a leading man, that would have to be the boy from the black country. Young people ask me all the time about Duncan Edwards. What was Duncan Edwards really like? Because the granddads have talked about him, and people like me have, have uh, we've, we've waxed lyrical, you know, about what a great player he was. 
Duncan Edwards was one of the youngest players ever capped by England, and at just 18 he was seen as certain to be a true great of the game. In 25 minutes they took the lead with a goal by Edwards. Look at this, wow, you know, finished up with the ball in the back of the net again, what a player. Well, if he played today, I'd, I'd be feeling sorry for a lot of defenders, wow. He was so strong and tough. The greatest player I ever played with, without any question. And I played with some great players, fortunately. I never thought there was any, any real footage of Duncan Edwards, but that is, wow, that was brilliant. With Edwards as their heartbeat, United won successive league championships. But triumph in their homeland wasn't enough. In 1956, United became the first English club to enter the European Cup, defying the English authorities in the process. And uh, Matt Busby, against the wishes of, of the Football Association, went into Europe because he said that was the future. And he was perfectly right. Because we were the champions, we were able to, to be the team that was going to, to actually burst into Europe and, and cause havoc with them. It was, it was just so exciting. It was the weather that caused havoc when United traveled to a snowy Spain in January 1957. They lost in a thrilling match to Athletic Bilbao. But a year on, United were back in the European Cup and playing in the snow once more. They took a one-goal lead to communist Yugoslavia to play Red Star Belgrade in the second leg of the quarter-finals. I remember it was freezing cold. It was really, really cold. And you can see little, little bits of snow and ice on the pitch there. That's, it, it was quite icy and hard and difficult. Um, but we'd come and we'd come to win. I remember all night, I remember the crowd, uh, stadium partisan, crowd partisan, I can assure you. Cameramen were recording ordinary images that were about to become unbearably poignant. Unfazed by the hostile atmosphere, United played swaggering football and were 2 nothing up in half an hour. And it got even better. This is Tommy Taylor, and he gives it to Kenny Morgan. Kenny Morgan, Duncan Edwards squares it back. It comes out to me, and I an easy side footer into the back of the net. I uh, wish they were all as simple as that. But it was us. We were, we were, we were at, at them from the beginning. 3-0 up, but the game wasn't won. And the dressing room at half time, somebody said, here, it's not all over yet. Well, how true his words were. Yugoslav television found the action more to their liking in the second half as United came under siege from a storm of Red Star aggression. I still believe anybody can play football in an empty room. But when they throw Duncan Edwards in her knobby style, you're not such a fan dancer, are you? That day at Belgrade, I can assure you, there were no fan dancers in the second half. There was no fan dancers anywhere. You stood up and you were counted. That's the way football was. And they scored three goals. They came back at us. And suddenly we were drawn three each. But United hung on to go through to the semi-finals 5-4 on aggregate. 50 years ago, a league, FA Cup and European Cup treble was still in their sights. That was a wonderful, happy time for a bunch of fresh, wonderful young players. That should be, that was a good time. We just thought they were going to be going to the moon, didn't we? Yeah. We did. We felt as though we were in heaven, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, we're just so excited, thought we're going to win everything this year. 
the players were so good and so talented and were, in my opinion, certain to win the European Cup. We were, we were certain to do it. Um, but, uh, but then when uh, we called in at, at Munich on the way back to refuel, there was some bad weather and, and of course, we all know what happened then. The Munich air crash of the crew of six and 38 passengers, 23 are known to have survived. A short time ago, British European Airways issued a list of identified dead. It includes the following names previously reported as unaccounted for. Curry, the Manchester United trainer, and Wally, their coach, and the following players, Byrne, Coleman, Jones, and Whelan. All we could think of was, you know, don't let it be true, you know, let it be a mistake. Even they're not really dead, you, you think they're dead, but they're not really. The aircraft was a twin-engined Elizabethan on charter from BEA. It was returning from Belgrade, where Manchester United had entered the semi-final of the European Cup. It had reached Munich and was just taking off for home in poor weather when the crash came at three o'clock. Well, I remember, I remember the, the plane going down the runway and, uh, and just keep going down the runway and going down the runway and, uh, and didn't take off. And I remember us going, hit, hitting a perimeter fence and then I don't remember. Daylight and darkness and sparks and things hitting you in the head. I thought for the first time, I've done well the first time in my life. I won't see my wife and my little girl again. The sequence of events is told in some of the many pictures that have been pouring into London from Munich by wire. Rescuers fought to recover people from the blazing fuselage. It was catastrophic, you know. It was catastrophic and you could, I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't put my mind to it. I, I just could never, I couldn't believe it really what was happening but it was a fact. On the fringe of a Munich airport lies the wreckage of an airliner, still smouldering from a crash in which 21 people were killed. Tragedy enough at It was four time. days before the first place, moving pictures of, of the crash were shown at the cinema. The newsreel reports were shocking in their simplicity. The soccer team Britain has produced since the war, and seven of them died in the crash. Duncan Edwards injured, Bill Fuchs injured. Mark Jones killed. Ray Wood injured. Eddie Coleman killed. David Pegg killed. Dennis Violet injured, Tommy Taylor killed. Roger Byrne killed. Bill Whelan killed, John Barry injured. At the time of going to press, Matt Busby was fighting for his life. The team secretary, Walter Crickmer, was killed. I just felt as though everything had, had gone. You know, I just felt as though there was going to be no more joy. You know, I just couldn't see anything but... You don't think there's a tomorrow, do you? No, yeah. You think that's it? The end? There's no tomorrow. There's nothing bright to look forward to. Three days before, the press had carried pictures of a confident team leaving for Belgrade. Pictures which remind us that with them were eight of the North's finest sporting journalists who would never see home again. Everybody wants to get back to Manchester. Two journalists who did survive were interviewed within hours of arriving home, and amid the tragedy, a story developed about the life-saving efforts of United's Irish goalkeeper. Everybody wanted to get off. Was Greg the hero of the crash? Definitely he was the hero yeah. of the crash. I mean, he, 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 I mean, having got out myself, I, you know, I ran. I, apparently he should do that, I don't know, but I, I ran. And, and I could hear him shouting, and I turned around and he had his arms out, you know, as if he was in goal. And he, what were you he, saying? He was shouting, come on lads, you know, let's get into it, you know. I come round that side and I found Bobby Charlton and Dennis Violet lying half in and half out of what was left of a wing. Dennis Violet had a very, very, very bad cut in his head. They both were dead, as far as I was concerned. You don't even think about pulses and all these things. I just dragged them about 20 yards away, left them over a pile of rubbish. It was, it was marvellous that uh, 
that he should be brave enough to actually do that. I don't know if I would, if I would ever be able to do it, but, but he went in and he helped as many people as he could, which was, which was marvellous and terrific, fantastic, really. And Greg didn't just save teammates. He also rescued a Yugoslavian woman and a baby daughter. Just as I got to the outside of the plane, I seen uh, Mr. a few of the boys hanging about, Peter here, and I called him to come back. I heard a kitty cry and it brought me to the senses. I lifted the kitty out and handed it to Peter. He took it away. In an archive store in Hamburg, Germany, a can of film has lain unopened for 50 years. Footage of the crash, now seen by the modest hero of Munich. You do what comes naturally to you on a certain day. So all this nonsense about what I'm supposed to have done, uh, I can do without it. I was the best goalkeeper in the world at one time. Not, not John Wayne. I am no different than anybody else. I am a survivor. End of story. Manchester, from the moment the news came through, was a city in mourning. Newspapers sold as fast as they could be printed. It was as though every family in a city of three quarters of a million people had suffered a personal loss, and so indeed they had. But Manchester didn't mourn alone. Grief enveloped the nation. And for those who produced films for the cinema, how they learned of the tragedy is etched on their memory. Movie Town House, the clearing house, where something like 80 million feet of film are processed and handled in a year. The London Centre... Well, when you read something like that for the first time, you don't forget it. Like most people can remember where they were were when Kennedy died and so on. It was one of those momentous moments. Football grounds throughout the country flew flags at half-mast and football fans wore tokens of mourning. Just two days after the accident, the English season continued in a muted atmosphere of respect. Samuelson recalls the mood. Well, my brief was to take pictures that showed the mourning Everybody's got a black armband on, the crowd was very still, nobody shouting and cheering. As the saying goes, even the, even the seats were in tears. Everybody was very sad and, sh and shocked and shaken. Fortunately for the survivors, the nearby Rex der Isere hospital is one of Europe's finest. While millions wait anxiously for news of the seriously injured men, the hospital staff work day and night to save them. And to their credit, four days after the crash, all are still alive. Matt Busby was their worst... Back in Munich, United's manager Matt Busby had been given the last rites, and 20-year-old Bobby Charlton was about to learn what had become of his teammates, his friends. Because I, because I had concussion, apparently, um, I was given an injection to, to make me sleep. And... Uh, and when I, when I woke up, there was a, there was a chap, um, a young man, actually, reading a paper. And he read, the, he read out all the names of the players. And I couldn't believe him. Because I, I, it was only then that I realised the enormity of it, I think. But... It was... Uh, I was a young lad, I couldn't believe it, really. I couldn't believe it. It was just an uh, absolute tragedy. You know, it's tragedy. Young players with, a, with the world at their feet. Pff, suddenly, no more. Bad news. Tragedy. Charlton's physical recovery was swift, and he was filmed as part of choreographed news reports. But behind the cheerfulness, was the irrational guilt of the survivor. The one thing uh, that you think, well, yeah, well, why, why was I survive? Why did I survive when, uh, and the others didn't? Fate, just luck, just luck maybe, uh, that I actually sat with my, seat, with my seat facing backwards instead of forwards. 
Perhaps the most moving scene of all was at Ringway Airport, where the Viscount airliner touched down. The flight from Munich Those dealt the cruelest fate returned to Manchester, and in the darkness, there was somebody who felt he had to be there. I wanted to go to the airport, and I went to the airport, but nobody knew I was there. The medical people said, no way. I was there. Tommy Taylor from Barnsley. Mark Jones from Moonwell. David Pegg from the mining area. And they become bright and beautiful lights for their families, don't they? They do. It's taken away, and it's taken away from their family. This beautiful jewel in their life. And that goes for almost every one of the people I'm talking about. For that family, for their grandparents, for their fathers, for their mothers, if they're married, for their wife and children, is that beautiful, shining, bright light a world star from the minefields of Yorkshire. Hmm. Great players and writers who made the sport live for millions at home were born in the slow cottage. Along the route to the club ground, a hundred thousand people stood in homage. Man hath but a little time here below. For these poor men, even that little was begrudged them and cut. I felt as though I had to be here. I had to say my personal farewell and thanks. Yeah. That's all I could say. I had to thank them because they gave me the happiest years of my life, those lads. They really did. Because um, even now, when I see the footage of that day, it, it's still hard. Once we'd actually seen the coffins going past, we knew that it was actually true. Less than a fortnight after the crash, United were counting down to an FA Cup tie. Assistant manager Jimmy Murphy gave an upbeat interview to the BBC. Right, we know, Jimmy, that things have been a bit hectic for you these last few days. How do you think they're sorting themselves out now? Well, these things take time, Frank, as you know, we're in a, a terrible mess really for players and so forth. Right, and uh, obviously Harry Gregg and Bill Folks have recovered from the experience of the Munich crash, sufficiently to play tonight in any event, but tell me, did you have any doubts about their selection? Oh, no, not to the slightest. You did They're both full of beans on top of the world, they've been training hard and actually looking forward in a big way to tonight's game. Now today you have helped to send somebody to take care of your top four inches and they give you a shrink or you go and see some guy. You didn't have that type of thing in those days. The best thing that could happen, nobody could have helped me, only myself. I believe that. Nobody could have helped me. The best thing that happened to me was get down to Old Trafford, either up the back on the concrete where we kicked, or to White City where we trained, to kick and fight and argue and do the things. I had to do those things. I had to get out of the house. I had to get involved again, or I definitely, I believe, you shouldn't say if, I'd have lost it up there. Old Trafford and 60,000 were there to see virtually a new United 11 take the field. Pieced together from reserves, the youth team and players hurriedly signed from other clubs, United were unrecognizable, even to their own goalkeeper. Mark Pearson, Alec Dawson, Shea Brennan, Freddie Goodwin, Ernie Taylor, Stan Crowther. I never met them. Harry Gregg goes into action. I've never known a, a game like it, really. I felt sorry for Sheffield. I really did feel sorry for Sheffield. There was such an emotion. It, it just dragged the best out of every player that was on the field, you know, and they ran the socks off. Within a few minutes, they're giving Sheffield goalie Brian Riles some work to do and the 60,000 crowd at Old Trafford, who came prepared to make all the allowances in the world, can hardly believe their eyes. It was a wonderful night, and yet such, such a dreadful night. We could only express our love of the Bays by what we were giving to this team. Um, and I just felt that the perhaps they were looking down on us and helping us to support them. 
Trafford, and 60,000 were there to see... There were four separate newsreel companies at Old Trafford that night. For the only surviving cameraman, the match could have only one winner. It didn't matter what team one supported, and I'm a lifelong Arsenal supporter. But for that period, I was a Manchester United supporter. Bobby Charlton injured in the crash, and Mr. Murphy, understudy to Matt Busby, now saw the ball curl into Wednesday's goal from a corner by Brennan. When the ball went in the net, the, the sound, the sound was just deafening, really. And, um, and we were on our way. We were on our way. 17-year-old Mark Pearson has the ball. Alec Dawson's ready to receive, and there's number three. Old Trafford seen so many great days, but for brilliant triumph over disaster, surely none will ever be as great as this. When they won the match, it was it was great, lad, because it, it released a lot of the tension, you know, and suddenly people had something to get to think about, other than what had just happened. A great victory and a match that will long be remembered. As the chairs followed the men of Manchester into their dressing room, what must they have been thinking? You know, I was lucky to be in the dressing room. Nobody said I could be. Nobody said I couldn't be. And um, if anybody looked at me as though I shouldn't be there, I looked straight back at them as though I should be there. The camera had more than one story to tell. The photograph that was taken in the dressing room immediately after the Sheffield Wednesday game, it doesn't need Harry Gregg or anybody else to describe it. All they've got to do is look at it. Focus his eyes and look at mine. Empty. Fifteen days after the accident, the incomparable Duncan Edwards died in hospital. According to the man who would play 106 times for his country, Edwards would have changed the course of English football history. Yeah, and by 1966 he would have been in his prime, you know. Um, and he would have played for England and he, he might have been holding the cup up for England instead of Bobby Moore. He was, he was just a born winner. I, I can't say enough about him. Really. He was as perfect a footballer as you could ever want. And just 70 days after Munich, television brings to all Europe the climax to Manchester United's revival, their second successive cup final. And Matt Busby is there with them. Can the living legend... Reaching that FA Cup final was remarkable, but when United went under to Bolton Wanderers, the losers couldn't muster much regret. The year of 1958 would always be remembered for other reasons. I can't express the love we felt for those babes. It's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's... Never forget them, never. I don't think the world will ever again, no, the world will never again see a group of players like the Busby babes. They were the best, without doubt. The more that, the, that, that people can actually see, see old footage of them, it pleases me a lot. It pleases me a lot because they, 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 I'm one of the few people that can actually say definitely, you know, that they were, they were so great. I'm sorry that they didn't fulfill the, um, their ambitions because they, they would have been good enough. Irresistible.